for the sake of time, I can start welcoming you all to our COP seminar, Community of Practice Seminary uh, webinar, actually. I know that you are, most of you are already familiar with this format and with our project. Um, the activity is part of uh, the HEAL program, the HEAL project, a regional project uh, financed by the uh, Swiss Development Cooperation and uh, a number of our donors and uh, uh, implemented by uh, BSF Swiss, uh, CCM and Hillary. And we're here also uh, thanks to the contribution of uh, ORCA funds to present to the to have a platform in which we can really share experience on one health and go beyond what we have in our specific project but trying really to share uh, our learning across the one health community so uh, today i'm really pleased to uh, introduce and welcome dr kelvin momiani who is the founding director of transdisciplinary consultant, is a one health specialist with uh, professional and research experience in one health planning, implementation, and evaluation. He currently works as a campaign officer at the World Animal Protection, where he delivers public facing campaign across Africa, envisioning creating a world where respect for farm animals and nature sits at the heart of the food system. Dr. Momiani also serves as an elected board member of the Kenyan Veterinary Association. He's a pioneer member of the Global Initiative with Veterinary Cancer Surveillance and a guest lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, contributing to the course integrated approach to health. His previous work has focused on uh, um, piloting integrated surveillance system for zoonotic diseases in Western Kenya under the Zulink project, research, advocacy, and awareness creation and in, and on antimicrobial resistance, animal welfare, and comparative oncology. And uh, specifically, and this is uh, uh, the topic of uh, our talk today, of our webinar today, on the evaluation of the implementation of the One Health project in Kenya. So welcome, Dr. Kelvin. Uh, very happy to be with you here today. And uh, we are looking forward to hear uh, your uh, the outcomes of your evaluation in Northern Kenya. I ask all the participants to mute it to yourself. And if you have any question, please use the chat box. Or you could, after at the end of the presentation of Dr. Mirmani, we could also unmute ourselves and ask the question verbally. Thank you very much. And over to you, Kelvin. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, have the team that worked on this work also uh, having joined us. I just confirm that you are able to see my screen uh, so that we can uh, dive in. And I'm very happy to see even in the participants that we do have in the participant list uh, and the actors who implemented this project. So welcome, my name is Kelvin. Uh, so I'm going to present to you a, a peculiar case of the implementation of a One Health project in uh, Northern Kenya. Um, this project was funded by uh, AIDS, which is an Italian uh, agency, um, but as well as co-implemented by partners, uh, which we'll be able to identify as we proceed. Um, so how did this work actually began? So the project began as a tender. It was an open tender by the AMREF Health Africa through CCM which was announced early in April, 2021. So we applied to this tender as a consultancy, transdisciplinary consultants, and we were awarded. The team that implemented this work, it was a team effort of myself, Aurelia, Adano, Joseph, Dibo, 
other data transcript uh, transcriptionists, but importantly, also the project staff at North Hall, who really made it possible for us to be able to implement this evaluation, especially in the planning stage, uh, doing the field visit, because you already know the terrain on the field, making our work uh, very easy. So what tools did we use in uh, doing this work? Uh, there were three tools that we deployed. One is the NEO, the Network Evolution of One Health, One Health Evolution Framework, which you can visit at that link and learn more about it. Essentially, this is a standardized tool, which was uh, implemented by the Coast Action, which is a European funded uh, project. And they have published actually a handbook under chapter three, which provides a step-by-step -step process of doing an in-depth uh, evaluation. We also deployed this tool called Evolving, which is evaluating knowledge integration capacity within multidisciplinary governance. There is a published paper which provides an in-depth uh, analysis of how this tool works. But as, uh, the highlights of how this tool, the two tools use the same questionnaire in implementing, but the Evolving now maps that questionnaire in what we call the project life cycle. Um, like from policy formulation, evaluation, and implementation. You can be able to position the project on which phase it is. Um, we also did the community survey tool. Essentially, this tool was meant to assess the knowledge, attitudes, and practices of the local pastoral communities. And the questions of this particular tool were developed based on the handbook. The project had developed a One Health handbook or education manual which was used to educate the community around aspects of hygiene and sanitation, zoonosis, health seeking behavior, mother and child health and water safety. So we wanted to understand has the project actually, how the, the beneficiaries of the project um, implemented, how has it changed their practices? How is their knowledge being integrated because of the implementation of this project? We deployed this tool using the a COBOL a toolbox. Uh, we also did the evaluation criteria using the OECD evaluation criteria, which is looking at the relevance, effectiveness, impact, efficiency, and sustainability with an additional one. So there was a, 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 a nice, instead of doing coherence, we did a, a one health multidisciplinary approach. How is the project actually implementing uh, the one health approach? The data was collected between uh, 7th and 21st June. Here we did focus group discussions uh, with the project staff, the VCOBA, who are the women groups, uh, who are given financial by the project so that they can be able to do activities, income generating activities, the One Health School Club, the communities, teachers, and also the mobile One Health Clinic, which we'll learn uh, later on what they were doing. We also did individual interviews with both the project partners, other external people, but also the other team members of the project. Key informant interviews were done through an array of um, uh, key informants, both from the county government, from the project staff, but as, always, as well as the other stakeholders and funders of the project. Community interviews were done. These areas were both uh, selected, both um, out outpost, outpost meaning there is an area that is away from the town, so it is interior but as well as also lo uh, locations which were within the urban setups. And we also did observations, field observations on how the One Health mobile clinic was working, the aggregates, how they are dispensing drugs and what, how they do the information, the communities, we also did observations how they, 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 they perceive the knowledge from the, the team when they go on the ground. Data collection was also done through the desk reviews through a range of uh, documents which are on your screen. We'll share this presentation, you can have a look at that. So data analysis for the One Health implementation, so to be able to understand what is the One Healthness of the project, this is usually uh, represented using a spider diagram, and there's a standardized uh, formula for calculating the One Health index and the One Health ratio. And then remember the evolving, we gives us how the project life cycle is all positioned from when. And then the qualitative analysis. This was done on the focus group discussions, key format interviews and individual interviews. Then these were thematically analyzed using the NVivo software. Uh, the survey, remember we did the community survey, these were analyzed using SPSS 25. 
Remember also, when we, uh, when we were analyzing the data, we were basing it on the, the, the expected results of the project. So here, we'll present them as outcomes and outputs, but as well as the object objectively verifiable indicators, which, which were summarized based on proportions. Then ethical consideration uh, were also done. Uh, we, we used the method of the British Sociological Association Statement of Ethical Practice in that the participant was clearly informed on uh, his, their participation, uh, how they can be able to decline. It was freely to them to be able to participate. And at any given time, they will actually stop the interview and uh, proceed. So what were, the, what were the findings from this evaluation? So we'll use the format of the One Health, uh, the NEO tool, the Network Revolution One Health Evaluation. Uh, it gives a systematic way of reporting. So we'll start by informing you what the system it is about. Then we go to giving you the outcomes and outputs. And then lastly, we'll go and delve into now the assessment of the One Healthness of the project. So the project was called the One Health. So it's a long name. So basically we'll call it the One Health project. It was the multidisciplinary approach to foster the health and resilience of personal communities in North and Kenya. The project was being implemented. It was funded uh, by the Italian uh, agency, but uh, co but co implemented by three partners. So the three partners were the AMREF, uh, Health Africa, uh, through CCM, who was the lead partner in this project. And then CCM was leading the human component or the human health component of this project. Then VSF Germany uh, was the other partner who was leading the animal health component of the project. There were other private sector partners at TRIM, which is a translate into meaning, who specialized in looking at the weather and GIS mapping. Then lastly, there was another partner from the academia, that is DIST, the University of Turin, which focused on the environment and climatic related uh, data analysis. Other locally, local partners who were engaged within this project were the government, the county government of Marsabit, that is the Department of Health, as well as the Department of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries. As you can see, it was actually quite a holistic uh, approach through a consortia. There were other stakeholders who came in to participate in this uh, project. Um, in terms of the location, as um, the project was being implemented in North Hall. Just to give you context, North Hall is a, a sub county within Marsabit, but the size of North Hall is the size of the entire Western Kenya. So you can imagine how large and expansive that particular sub county is. But the project uh, focused on Maikona, Dukana, and North Hall awards within that sub county. The project ran for 39 months until July 31st, but it was initially meant to end on 30 April, but it was approved for an extension to July uh, 31st, making it uh, 39 months. It was funded by the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation, the I I AICS, but with uh, other co-funding coming from the Italian Bishops uh, Conference. The objectives, the general objective basically was to improve the health and resilience of pastoral communities in Northern Kenya, but specifically to improve the coordination of human, animal and environmental health, so as to strengthen that response system and resilience among pastoralists. So I want you to focus on those specific objectives because we want to see at the end of it all, did actually the project manage to achieve this objective? Maybe interesting. Then the expected results are very also, they're very peculiar because they want to provide access to health and veterinary services to pastoral communities. They wanted to increase the awareness of these pastoral communities around zoonotic diseases, sanitation and hygiene, and other common prevention and control mechanisms around zoonosis. They wanted to also improve the saving capabilities of families because the assessment, the needs assessment identify that the families, they usually have, they don't have money to go either for veterinary services or human health services. So they wanted to capacity build, provide income generating activities for these pastoral communities that they can have extra cash that they can be able to spend in health services. Then lastly, it is to integrate traditional and scientific knowledge um, so that to improve that DSA, the decision support uh, system within the community of pastoralists. 
The four, at the end of it all, we want to ask ourselves, were they achieved? So let's find out. So let's begin by looking at the drivers and rationale. Really, why do we need to, why was this project meant to be implemented in this particular county? One, the county, remember the project is being implemented among the Gabra community, which is a community which is maybe uh, from literature and also from the needs assessment, this is a community which was not having sufficient of uh, human and animal health services provision among them. They were being affected by zoonotic diseases or spillover because of the intermingling of humans, animals within the same environment. That poor access of human and animal health services. Financial vulnerabilities, because as we mentioned before, they don't have that um, extra cash to be able to spend on health or animal services because of other priorities. So the project wanted to <clears throat> provide what you call income generating activities. So these are some of the drivers. And lastly, is this climate change. On the bottom right, you'll notice one of the key informant mentioned that actually climate change is affecting pastoralists who rely on livestock by making rainfall unpredictable with the less opportunities to prepare and cook. These are specific reasons why One Health was being implemented here and more, these are just a snapshot. The project team really comprised of a wide range of uh, specialties, both from human health uh, sector, animal health sector, they had an accountant, they had uh, community liaison officers, two drivers were there, but there was also that management level, what they call the partnership management committee, which, was co which had also the country representative was among there. The health advisor, who is a medical doctor, was also part of that team. But remember also, we have the three partners whom we mentioned before. The VSF Germany who was leading the animal health component. The CCM was leading the human health component. DIST who was looking at the climatic factors and environment. And then TRIM who was looking at the GIS uh, perspective. So it was a very holistic uh, team there. Community network, the, the project also had a wide uh, community network, just to give you a snapshot, I'll not go into many details. They linked up to the ministries through the CSG, the county steering group, okay? Then here they had those links to the Ministry of Health, veterinary department, left of department. There was also the One Health School Club, so therefore they were also working with the schools within the regions where they were, they were working. The Vicobas, who are the women groups who are being supported by grants so that they can be able to do income generating activities. These are also a community network. Another one very important uh, component of this project is the community service providers who are trained so that they can be able to offer uh, services uh, to their community. These were nurses, the household health agents, the community disease reporters, the community health volunteers. These are also part of this community network. As you can see, it's quite ex extensive. And lastly, there were the private actors like the clinics, the chemists, the agrovets, who are providing service provision to the community. So I want you to view then, so you have to have this in your mind when you're looking at the implementation of this project. It's not working alone, but it is working within the boundaries of Marsabit, but also working with the other stakeholders in it, all right? As we proceed. Uh, next is the community needs, remember, when the project was being implemented, they had to do a needs assessment. And when we also did our interviews, this through the focus group discussion, key informant interviews and individual interviews with the communities, these were the highly uh, mentioned needs. One is water. Water is a problem in terms of one accessibility, in terms of distance. Sometimes they have to move almost 40 kilometers away to fetch this water. And even when they get this water, sometimes it can be of poor quality. Like you will notice in one of the last slides is that the project had to respond to an emergency of camels dying because of a contamination of a well. You see, this is a challenge to them. So in your mind, you might try to think, how can we help this community? And I think this is the, the critical importance actually of me even making this presentation, is to be able to highlight these problems and identify solutions among the stars on how to help them. Illiteracy topped also the list. So meaning that when implementing some of this play within this community, you have to involve educating, adult education, so that the knowledge you're giving them is able, is, is, so they can be able to be integrated among, in this, um, among themselves. Animal health services, as you mentioned, even from the drivers, it was a key one, poor uh, access of the animal and even human health services within these areas. 
all right? Because they are neglected, actually, all right? Toilets, very key one. Now, since I don't want to bore you reading all through, I'm going to play this video so that the, the community uh, person himself can be able to tell you some of these challenges. So let's just listen to him. So what should the project do for you again? Um, mm. <laughs> Water. <laughs> 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 Alternative to the any livelihoods, for example, we depend on livestock. One attack another alternative, come and maybe crops growing or crops. Okay. Aye, Sadi, Tauriti, Ta Obruti, Tabisaniti, Tachoti, Aye, Tadibi man. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to what was the theory of change? Basically, how is the project trying to achieve its uh, outputs and outcomes and essentially impacts? One is that the project worked in partnership with the county governments, as you mentioned before. So you're working with the three partners, uh, D-Stream, okay, and even the local partners within the county government, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Livestock. Okay, the community also a very central people whom they were working with is the community service providers who are trained, on um, disease uh, reporting, disease surveillance, then they were able to collect this data and report back to the system, but also go to the community and educate them about uh, uh, sanitation and hygiene, zoonotic diseases, and everything that was within the One Health Handbook. So the community service providers are also a key component. Then the project now came to operationalize One Health within uh, this particular uh, setup. So why operationalize it is because they identify that zoonotic diseases and environmental challenges that are existing, so they can be able to bridge uh, that gap. Then lastly, deploy income generating activities so they can be able to have some sufficient income uh, to be able to either go to hospital or help the animals uh, at the end of it all. Then uh, lastly is to be able to use integrate local knowledge and scientific knowledge so that to have a decision support tool. 
we are going to this to see this in our next uh, slides. Now, we the next section. Now we want to see. So we've seen the background of the project, the drivers, the rationale, the theory of change. What the project want to achieve now? What has the project achieved? So let's see some of the outcomes and outputs. Preliminary assessments that were done gave some very useful information of understanding what is affecting the local people. What are the perceptions of these people towards diseases, towards their health? As you'll come to realize uh, some of these reports are available is that the Gabra community really love the animals. They'll do anything to help the animal even above themselves. So they'll put the animal first. So that's a very critical information there. And then the other thing is that uh, the picture on your right, that is an intestine reader. Person is, is, is able to look at the intestine, then predict whether there will be rain or there will be drought coming. Now, there's a simple activity, an interesting activity that the project did with the participants in the community. They asked them to rate for them the reliability of the various methods of predicting climatic or uh, in information about the weather. As you can notice from that particular scale, they mentioned the reliability of the intestine readers is there, behavior of livestock, they also look at it, but they were not able to relate how information from NDMA or KMD. What does this inform us? inform us? Either this information from these authorities are not reaching the community, okay? And these were interesting findings that the project found so they can be able to bridge that gap, how to bring the information closer to the community. And that is how those community health actors come into play. That is the CDRs and the CHVs and HHS. So they can be able to go and integrate this inform scientific information to the community for them to be able to compare and contrast which is more reliable. And surprisingly, you'll come to realize is that the community came to, to actually identify with the science that actually science does predict and it's more accurate because in science tells you the rain will rain 12 p.m. tomorrow and this time, they came to realize it's giving them accurate information. These are some of the reports that the project has actually produced. Important is that an important uh, information, maybe for some of all of us who are working in the One Health uh, interventions, is that interventions have to be grounded on solid anthropological evidence because it gives you useful information on how to intervene with the community, where, who to use, and when to be able to intervene with this community. You can notice from these, in these reports, they inform them about the health and seeking behaviors of pastoralists, and even how the pastoralists uh, look at the drinking of milk, the meat, and even the health seeking behaviors, which is very important information when you bring new interventions to them. Project also did capacity building, training of the CDR, CHVs, okay, and those traditional and religious uh, uh, leaders, okay in terms of uh, health and sanitation, zoonotic diseases, uh, how to be able to uh, inform people to go to hospitals or health seeking behavior interventions were also done. Then a subset of this train uh, uh, of, of these uh, community health uh, uh, people were also trained on disease, on, on data collection methodologies. Here is about how to read the climatic data in either a, thermome a thermometer or a rain gauge then how to collect this data using a stream, stream map, which is a mobile application, then plotting this data to be able to decipher some trends and some information from it. So building local capacity informs us it's a very sustainable way of investing in One Health interventions or initiatives. Because even after the One Health project leaves Northport or Northern Kenya, it will mean that the people who are trained will still continue um, having this knowledge, they'll be able to impact their generations to come and generations to come. So let's go one by one and look at how was uh, this capacity building resulting to community education, disease surveillance, and technical assistance. So in One Health Education, you'll notice that uh, it was being implemented through several sessions. On your right, that sandburst uh, diagram. Barazas, just meetings of Wazis. Sorios is a celebrations when they usually have celebrations. So you'll notice that the project identified unique uh, avenues or channels to be able to pass this information. And I think that's the most relevant information you can pick from this slide. That we, as uh, One Health practitioners, we always have to identify locally relevant entry points for One Health interventions. Maybe in your community, it could be a, a church 
where you need to pass that information. Maybe in your community is a school. So use that information that can be able to channel that information efficiently and effectively. Yeah, that's the key information there. Main topics that were, that were shared during day or like days, uh, you can notice the graph on your right is around hand washing. COVID, remember when the project was being implemented is when we had also an outbreak of COVID, 2019-2020. Okay, so the, the, the project had to be flexible and uh, enough to be able to integrate current issues within their training sessions. All right, so that's amazing. Being able to be flexible as a One Health initiative is also very key. And therefore, doing a needs assessment at the beginning of the project can inform you what content to place in your information communication materials and the approach you can be able to use. That's essentially what we are picking from this slide. Active disease surveillance was done. As you'll notice, they picked various uh, zoonoses. Brucellosis is one of the highest, in both animals and humans. Rabies, anthrax, calaza also comes in. I think important from here is that Surveillance is key and it can also inform planning and even decision making at both county, sub county, and even national level. So, investing in a robust surveillance system is key. Technical assistance was also done through by the CDR, CHVs, and HHS. Animal disease reporting was done. Uh, defaulter tracing were done. Immunization, as you'll notice the line at the bottom, this NAS specifically said this. The uptake of immunization has increased among children as compared to the past. The number of defaulters has reduced tremendously. Cases of severe to moderate malnutrition have reduced. I think we need to pause and ask yourself, why has this reduced? It's simple. Delivery of health services to the community where they need it and in the right way does work. That's the key information we are picking from here. Um, the mobile One Health unit, the project also deployed integrated uh, interventions of both animal and human health services, but also including environmental uh, services within it. As you'll notice, they reached almost 15,000. It's important to clarify here, this figure is up to March 2021 when we were doing our evaluation. But remember, the project ended in July. So we might have even higher figures more than this. And these were achieved mainly through 192 missions. Let me put some context here. This is North Hall. It is close, it's actually a very dry area. It's next to the, the driest uh, desert in Kenya. The terrain is very difficult to move. The distance from one Manyata to the next can be very far. So achieving these numbers can click in your mind is actually very good. Okay, that's the main point I want to bring here. Bottom right gives you an, a community person says this, to the whole community there are outreaches they do with human health and animal health personnel that go far where people cannot access such services. So mobile clinics deployment has to be context specific. Here, we want to bring it to context because there could be other dryland areas, maybe they want to implement the same approach. I think it's important to also go down to your ground and do a needs assessment and see, will a mobile clinic work for you or not? That's why we are saying it has to be context specific. There are some regions where it can't work. There are some regions where it will, be, where it will work. Where it will work, it does the job very well. Common diseases affecting animals were also identified. As you can notice, helminthiasis, tick infestations were on the top of the list. If you can be able to look at that photo of camels, you can be able to see off lesions within those particular animals. And therefore, doing this reporting can also inform county planning and decision making, especially in disease uh, intervention. Community-based weather monitoring and uh, disease um, Disaster risk response were also done. The staff, the local authorities, CDS were trained on climate data collection. They were able to identify these were the extremes. So they were, if you look at the photos, they were able to do the register in the books, but these were also shared through the system to the Telegram chatbot, okay? Where the members of the community, some local authorities were there and they were able to actually visualize the changes in temperature, changes in rainfall, to inform them how to advise their communities on the ground. If, for instance, there's a, a rain that's supposed to come, they'll be able to advise their communities that they can be able to move to either better places to avoid that adverse effects of um, 
of the rain or the droughts, okay? Then there's that infrastructural investment that the project did, provision of one automatic weather station and also eight manual station. This is a live investment. So I think the challenge is nice for either the county government to take this up and either do maintenance on it and also provide maybe uh, some um, additional support that people will be collecting this uh, data from it. Database and dissemination systems were implemented and they are existing. And these dissemination systems are linked to Telegram, there are maps which have been produced and bulletins. For the photo on your right, it does show actually real-time sharing of this information. Like for instance, here there was uh, this, a mass death of animals after drinking water from a shallow well. So as you can see, when this information is relayed in instantly, and within the group you have some people who can intervene, then it helps that quick intervention within a given short time. Qualitative environmental analysis were done, but here I want to focus around the, the analysis of the relation between vegetation cover and human brucellosis. So what the project did is that they found that um, death of animals immediately after rain preceded drought is, it was because of that sudden drop of temperatures. It simply means that it can inform these uh, CDRs to inform their communities that if there is an incoming, maybe uh, rain that is coming, they are able to advise their communities well how to avert this sudden death of their animals. One, uh, the students were also capacity built and trained. You know, we went to these schools. We asked the students, these were photos that we took on the right. We told them, just tell us what you learned about One Health. You will be surprised these students are so bright. They know a lot. They know that One Health is about that working between uh, human health, animal health, environmental health. They know about that the output is about helping our communities to be able to be ready in case of, uh, of, of, of something adverse happening in the environment. They, are, they have been able to learn the importance of cleaning the environment. So they do undertake environmental cleanups, but they did request they need some more, maybe capacity building, more uh, facilitation in terms of infrastructure. Like when they're going to clean, they need some gloves, okay, so that they're not bitten by the, by the uh, scorpions within the environment. So I think these are some of the things which other stakeholders in the group can think of and how to proceed in intervening in this area. So this is investment in the future generations. And from our interview, the focus group and the community, we came to learn when information is passed to the student, when the student goes home to tell the parent, remember the parent may be a bit difficult to change, when they listen to the student, they are able to become more liable to change. So investing in the students is um, a very nice idea also. Um, IEC materials were developed and these were developed to the context. They were locally adapted. You can see the images. There are images showing how gabras are actually helping animals. They are, it's actually more appealing to them because they're able to relate to these images and therefore training them becomes very easy. And the use of infographics, easy to use, simple messaging was the hallmark of it. The project was established, uh, is in the process of establishing a county one health unit. They have held several meetings towards this, a workshop and a training, which was by the National ZDU. And we also did a, a workshop with them um, uh, during the month of after around July and August. We came to learn actually the cohorts, all the people working within the Ministry of Health, uh, livestock, there's some who came from the environment, there's some who came from um, disease surveillance, uh, others who, who are epidemiologists. They do have the solutions. Like for instance, they came up with a vision for their county that they want to see. They want to see a zoonosis free and prosperous Marsabit County. They were able to also identify the root causes. Is this social cultural aspects and poor governance has interests of one health success in Marsabit County. I think the next steps now are, I know the project is taking it up, is now to find a way of integrating and pushing this uh, forward in terms of uh, having an MOU, having integrating the, the coho within either the CSG so that it can be able to be facilitated and given some either money or funding or goodwill from these agencies so that it's more sustainable uh, over time. But they did realize that the problems are complex. One health, comp one health problems are complex and they have to be tackled through experimentation. 
but also through goodwill from the counties and investment. Series of dissemination sessions have been done through virtual webinars. The VCOBAs have done, have been, have been, um, they were given grants initially. They identified uh, uh, these women groups from Platin villages benefiting 390 women. I think you can see the average net is almost 1 million, 1.2 million. The group's profit on investment ranges from 120,000 to almost 280,000. So you can see when investing in these groups can result to them becoming more, less vulnerable to, less vulnerable to anything that maybe can destabilize them within the course of time. Therefore, meaning that they might have even the opportunity to create more businesses. Like during our interviews with the women groups, they informed that they have created businesses like now, new business like selling livestock, new business like selling seedlings, uh, kitchen gardening, some of them do that. Some of them are doing, um, they are doing small hotels where people can come and see that they can make money. So they are innovative. All they need is that little support from um, uh, development partners, from research institutions, they need other interventions so that they can be able to move a ladder harder, uh, 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 up, up the ladder in their socioeconomic uh, uh, status. Uh, and lastly is this emergency uh, response. The project also did respond to a lot of emergencies like um, a rabies outbreak in Gas and Malabot, okay, where the project assisted in the vaccination and creation of awareness. Provisional PPEs in Kalacha Hospital. Uh, also the project was supported in uh, buying the oxygen um, within the hospital itself. A multi-hazard uh, assessment within uh, Marsabit County, which has been integrated within the NDMA. So all this, what is it telling us? When planning for a project within hard to reach areas, then you have to also incorporate an emergency response fund because it's important. When you don't do that, then it can eat into your budget, then you cannot be able to deliver on some of your activities. Overall, what are we seeing? From our evaluation, the project actually achieved 63% of its expected outcomes and 52% of its output. But a caveat is this, the outcomes or outputs that were not achieved, it was because of either one, those out activities or outcomes, they were affected by COVID-19. A typical example was like this on exchange visits, uh, visits among women groups could not be possible because you also had to safeguard the health and welfare of the of the participants and therefore this activity could not be implemented. Um, now let's hear some of the impacts from the One Health Project Consortium Coordinator, that is Tamara uh, from the horse's mouth. My name is Tamara Litame and I work as a One Health Project Consortium Coordinator at the North Tor Project. Uh, the North Tor Project has helped the pastoral communities at the North or Sub County by accessing human and animal health services in remote areas where otherwise such a, uh, services are rarely accessible. The project also helped elders to pay more attention to their health and the one of the environment as strictly connected to the health of their animals, which are their main livelihoods. One Health Project also contributed to sensitize the communities about the connection of weather related events with the human, animal and environmental health and the importance of data collection and recording for future preparedness. An added value is also contributing to support women in having their own income generating activities and deal with main needs in the households when the husbands are far in the fora. I also think the project contributed, contributed to give the communities a key role in their own development with community actors becoming real change agents. Okay, so that was from the One Health Project Consortium uh, coordinator, uh, Tamara. My, sorry, Kelvin, to interrupt you. Yes, please. I hope you, you, you can uh, be fast because I would like really to leave some time for the discussion. Are you almost sure. done? Thank you. Yes. Thank yeah, you yeah. very much. Yeah, almost there. <laughs> so I'll go a bit quick for through this now. Community survey uh, and some impacts that came out of it is that uh, high literacy levels actually is there. I think our recommendation is there's need to incorporate adult education within the sessions in future programming. Um, something else is the livestock is actually the main income source. Okay, 
And the main reason why they own livestock is because it provides a food for their family and is also a source of income. All right. And they also trade these items. A good example is that during the focus group discussions, the women, they told us the income they get is actually to buy food. These are the priorities, pay fees, medical bills, livestock drugs. As you can see, those are some of the priorities when they get the, 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 the money. Awareness has increased on zoonotic diseases. As you can see, participants who are aware about the one year project had the highest awareness levels, but also there is high risky practices also here, which can result in infection or infection, like testing of the milk to check quality using their thumbs, improper disposal of byproducts. Those, those are some of the other risky practices that we observed. Improved health seeking data among humans is very high. Now women are going to hospital uh, to, see, to seek antenatal care. Uh, they, but this is also curtailed by either if they, if let's say the mobile one health clinic will not be sustainable over time, then them walking these long distances, uh, getting money to pay for either diagnostic tests might curtail that uh, that health seeking behavior. So these are some of the things that has to be addressed either at county level to provide a dedicated fund to say, sustain this uh, the mobile one health unit. And then I think a key lesson for us here. Interventions have to be customized to that nomadic nature of uh, these communities. So therefore, a mobile one health clinic is a very important intervention in this uh, setting. There's increased awareness on hygiene and sanitation. This we noted it, especially among both the one health, uh, those who knew about the one health project and those who are not. But there are also, also barriers to entry. Yes, they know that they need to click the wash hands with, with the water and soap. But you'll find that when you did uh, our observations, they didn't have the water and they didn't have the soap. So this becomes a barrier to action or implementing uh, that particular good practice. Waste disposal, they both were aware actually the problems that can result to, uh, that can result from uh, disposing poorly waste like blot in livestock. But importantly is that um, they were able to showcase the impacts of waste to livestock as compared to impacts of waste to humans. This also retraces the, init the initial uh, observation that livestock is very important uh, to them. But in future, they need to be told more about how, to, how, how waste disposal can also affect the environment and safely disposing placentas, which you'll notice that sometimes they throw them uh, within, the, within the, the, the fields and then dogs can be able to pick them up. But what we also realize, the placenta for the camel is never thrown anyhow. It's usually thrown on top of the tree because they believe the camel is uh, sacred. Animal health practice and use of veterinary drugs, this was low, the knowledge around this was low because they do not seek professional services or animal health services. They usually go to aggravate, they buy it, then they self-medicate. This, as you realize, may bring even a huge problem about microbial resistance. Therefore, food intervention should promote this prudence of antimicrobials in this region. So reason this could be possibly because of that uh, maybe lack of uh, availability of the animal health services within this community. Immunization has gone up, as you noticed from the previous slide. But uh, importance is that uh, this could be, could be affected if let's say this model of mobile one health clinic could be either not be sustainable over time. Nutrition and balanced intake has gone high, especially among children and women. Breastfeeding, this is a community we came to realize actually breast almost 100% of them meet the national target of breastfeeding six months continuously. 50% of them actually breastfeed up to three years. What we could not confirm is whether it is exclusively on uh, breast milk, okay? So our, I think our key take home is such cultural obligations because that's actually a cultural obligation for GABRA to breastfeed their children can be used for future to amplify and promote other good practices uh, in future. Low awareness of AMR, I think we've already looked at this, and this needs to be addressed in future interventions. Um, Self-initiated infrastructure development, some of them built uh, small dams and also toilets. This is something that has come to the And therefore, by building these toilets and dams, it is resulting to that improvement of sanitation and hygiene within the community. Reducing financial vulnerabilities has been implemented because it, it has generated more incomes to the women, which results to more creation of jobs, both to women and men who are profiting from that particular creation of business. But they have also run into challenges by this cropping up of new businesses. Now they are asking, how do we find markets for this livestock? Long distances to travel to fetch this, to buy the goods. 
COVID-19 regulations, high expenses in moving livestock from one area to another. So a livestock value chain analysis may need to be done and also improve them as they are building these new value chains within here. Community-based people-centered early warning systems have been deployed. As you can see, they're able to share information through the telegram to inform, and also the information from the data has been integrated in the NDMA uh, bulletin, as you can read there. Then there's also a digital platform where this information is accessible by both the project staff and other uh, government personnel who have been given access. It is an access uh, style. So it can tell you that spatial and temporal analysis of uh, weather hazards or animal health uh, observations, etc. I'll skip this because this is also another video where they tell us, the lady tells us about the benefits of the project to them. We'll come back to it. Then I'll go to this one. The last section is the One Healthness of the Initiative. Remember the overall evaluation, we, we use the One Health Index and then the One Health Ratio. The project showed a medium capacity for facilitating the integration of One Health knowledge. As you can see, there was pronounced. So how you read the spider diagram is uh, how the scoops are spreading to the corners. So the further it spreads, the better the project is, is performing. The closer the blue is towards the center, the, the lower the performance. Basically, that's how you interpret it. So the project did very well in the, it is doing uh, pronounced in the planning and sharing, as you will notice, planning and sharing 0 0.6 and 0 0.6 is, that's very good, but also needs maybe some improvement around the one health thinking and the one health learning, which we'll provide uh, in the next one. The one health index and ratio shows us, it basically shows us the balancing of the operational elements of the project and the infrastructural uh, elements of the project. Uh, so far, the one health uh, ratio is 0 0.77, which indicates, I think, a pronounced achievement in supporting infrastructural component. As you can see on your right, infrastructure component has scopes moving towards the edges, meaning it is doing very well in that. So the learning, the sharing, systemic organizations are pronouncedly uh, implemented in this project. Um, here, we basically give now the integration of the neo and evolving canalysis. So on the project of, uh, formation, we look at one thinking and planning. What basically is telling us that um, the project needs to provide um, in future, it needs to more emphasis on doing a needs assessment and involving the community uh, in doing the needs assessment, but as well as, um, yeah, that's basically it there. Then in, in implementation is about uh, future programming should move from the single communities only GABRA, but maybe expand the project that the benefits can expand to other uh, communities. Uh, in uh, one sharing and learning, I think it's about building that uh, environment whereby the individual learning can be facilitated, either through facilitating through workshops, trainings, building capacity, but also having um, building what you call a memory of the institution, having a knowledge hub, whereby even if you have a high turnover of staff, any staff will come back and be able to access that knowledge within a given portal. So promoting institutional memory. Then recommendations, which we're getting to the end is, need to co-design the project right from the start with the community and the leadership, okay? Then one health, this is generally, but also specific to the project, is that you need, when designing, you need we need now to shift from event-based response, like lately responding to rabies, to responding to this disease, to establishing patterns, like what the project was trying to do, doing reporting and surveillance so that you can be able to do that prevention early enough. You'll be able to know here, we need to start vaccinating. Here, we need to start the warming. Schedule surveys that you can be able to track and see, are you making progress or not? Then you need to have a broader stakeholder engagement when you're doing interventions, both from environmental, human health, even economists, even architecture. So it will depend on which One Health initiative and what is your end goal. So you can be able to bring the relevant disciplines on board. You need to have formal commitments, not word of mouth, because when you have a government coming into place, you need to have formal signing, either an MOU, so that you can be able to rubber stamp it, so that they can be able to engage them for sustainability. Otherwise, if you're just having word of mouth, then it cannot be more sustainable. Stakeholder mapping is very key so that you can be able to know how do you interact with different stakeholders. On the right is just a small um, a graph that can be able to help you in doing that stakeholder mapping, um, something that you can try it out. Being a manage, a knowledge management hub, very key. 
in a One Health interventions. I'll skip this a bit, then conclusions. Basically, the conclusion so for us is um, uh, this video, is the community, we already saw this video. Conclusion is to reiterate that um, the community is still faced by great challenges, as they mentioned, water, they still want the food, famine, drought is still there, toilets is still there, still need more, more of this support is still required from the development community. And even researchers should go in and identify better ways of implementing it. Then lastly, check out. So far, we've really learned how the one project was implemented by Ambre Health Africa, by the lead partner CCM and partners in Northern Kenya. We've known the unique challenges facing pastoralists in Northern Kenya. We've identified, probably you've already identified areas of further research or intervention from my, from my presentation. And I hope you've appreciated the One Health, what it takes to do a One Health evaluation and its added value in hard to reach settings. So thank you for listening to me. And also thank you um, Hill Project for the opportunity to present to your audience and to the audience. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with me and for taking a lot of your time. Asatani, and back to you, Nicole. Thank you very much, Kelvin. Uh, well, uh, I do understand that uh, it is a massive project because it took you quite a lot to explain all the results. Uh, we still have very uh, few time for, 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 for clarifying questions, if there is any. I just wanted to um, underline, and I forgot to, to mention it at the beginning of our presentation, that this project is part of the HEAL project. So uh, luckily, we have the opportunity to learn from uh, uh, our experience in your tour and to capitalize the lesson learned, to make sure that uh, your recommendation can really be uh, taken on board to improve and uh, uh, expand the One Health approach within pastoral communities, not only in our tour, but through a sharing of experience, also through the other uh, different uh, sites where the HEAL project is working. So I open the floor for, for questions. I see that there are no questions specifically on the chat box, but I ask, uh, uh, yes, I see that there is uh, Alexander who wants to say something, ask something, please unmute yourself. And um, we have a few minutes, but please. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Alexandre Caron. I'm, I'm uh, working for CIRAD, a French research organization. I'm based in, currently in Mozambique. Thank you for this presentation. It was very, very interesting, uh, a lot of information. Um, maybe what, from completely outside of the project and the context, uh, what we may uh, miss from, from, from that presentation, uh, just saying that it was a very good presentation, but just going on to the, the, the main uh, uh, question or that we have is that what was the previous context of, of that project? Did it start from scratch or is it something that built on a uh, previous project as well? I think this is an important uh, uh, aspect. The second one is uh, what about the, the an idea about the funding of that project? Because the, the, the quantity of activities that have, that have been implemented looks looks amazing, and it will be uh, interesting to have a, a, a relative idea to understand what what uh, uh, with how much funding that can be uh, uh, accomplished. And and then finally, um, just uh, one critique about the two parts of your presentation. On, on the first part, you, you present us with a, with a wonderful project that where almost everything has been working perfectly. And then you rushed in the last section about more uh, uh, one health uh, indicators in which uh, you, you show that there, there have been some issues. And in fact, when you do an evaluation, uh, it, it's interesting also to share a lot about those issues because we may face exactly the same issues in the future. So maybe I would like a few comments uh, about that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you so much for that uh, feedback. Uh, I totally agree. I'll start, I'll start with your last question. Yes, 
the last section does actually highlight uh, the challenges and actually provides uh, recommendations on how to address. Uh, sorry that I rushed to, uh, around that because of the time that was there, but I'm sure Alexander will, I know uh, Saba will be able to share the presentation with the participants so that you can be able to read maybe through index. And if you have maybe any question that you'd like to follow through, you can reach out to me and we can be able to discuss uh, uh, further. Yes, in terms of the context, I understand, uh, I'm happy that um, some of the project actors are here. And it's true, the project didn't start um, all the way from scratch. Remember the partners who are being involved in this project like um, uh, VSF Germany already have worked within the context of North Horror and Northern Kenya for many years. And therefore they built on their, on their successes, their challenges, and um, they also, AMREF Africa has also, AMREF Health Africa has also worked in Africa for, for quite a long time. So it is based on the experiences and the challenges uh, working with the communities that they feel that they want to deploy as a pilot, a One Health approach in addressing human and animal health challenges within the community of pastoralists. So this was a kind of like a, a trial running of a One Health project. And I think from it, they have picked some successes, some challenges. And that's how I think Nicole has mentioned the Hill project now is coming in to be able now to build on that foundation and further improve either on the build on the successes, further improve on the challenges, build on the core recommendations uh, going forward. Indeed, indeed, you are right. The funding and resources in the evaluation, it does highlight that actually um, resources and funding versus even, even the time allocated to the project was uh, a bit short. Um, and I think that's why even Hill is coming now on board to be able to, 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 to extend uh, a lifeline to this project going forward. But also to add, it was also interrupted by COVID-19, a huge percentage of the implementation time, although the project I know was given an extension to be able to implement. Even resources in terms of money, yes, it was actually a little from our particular evaluation. And hopefully in future, more funding will be provided for this kind of work. Uh, back to you, Mikon. Thank you very much, Kelvin, and thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, um, I hope that uh, Kelvin provide you with, uh, with a satisfactory uh, answer. Um, I'm sorry uh, that uh, we took long in the presentation, uh, but uh, we really need to, to close. Uh, I saw that already uh, part of the participant left the meeting. I take the opportunity to thank again uh, Kelvin. As uh, Calvin said, the presentation and the recording of the of the webinar will be on the Hill website uh, very soon, and uh, it will be shared with all the participants. Thanks once again to Dr. Calvin and for, to all of you for participating, and uh, to the next meeting and the next webinar. Thank you very much.